Um, hi, everybody. So um, I um, show this example to uh, kind of get people to think a little bit about this problem of uh, generalizing AI deep learning models, in particular, to real world situations. So, um, you know, you, you hear a lot about deep learning these days, and I'm sure a lot of you, if not most of you, are using deep learning. Um, so, would you, would you say that this deep learning revolution has solved AI? How many people think that we're done? We've solved AI. All right, I got one. I got two. Awesome. So, um, you know, obviously you guys are going to be skeptical uh, when I ask you this kind of question, um, especially since a lot of you work probably with deep learning, so you know its limitations. But for many people, it sort of, you know, seems like magic probably. And it, um, I'm going to show you this video. Um, so these are some uh, brave individuals, and by the way, don't try this at home. They're testing self-driving cars. Um, and so they're actually testing how well the car will stop if it sees a pedestrian. So let's see what happens. Right, so the guy's gonna stand in front of the car and very good, the car stops until <laughs> it doesn't. So, so that's a failure of detecting the pedestrian, obviously, and stopping. So, you know, clearly um, there's still some things that uh, deep learning and, and deep learning for vision and perception recognition hasn't quite solved. Um, and one of these things is what I call a data set bias or another term for it is domain shift. Um, and basically, this is this problem that uh, deep learning models are extremely data hungry. They need lots and lots of labeled data to learn accurate models of objects and other things. So, so when you train, uh, let's say you train your self-driving car on, you know, you have some giant convolutional network uh, that's learning to map pixels to objects, pedestrians, cars, road, and so on, right? So you need that for a self-driving car, obviously. You need it to know where the pedestrians are so it can stop. But if you train it on a large amount of labeled data, let's say this data comes from California, right? So you collected, you got into a car, you collected hours and hours of data, you trained your car, you labeled all the pedestrians, um, and it works very well. Now you try to uh, drive the car uh, or have the car drive around in Boston or Philadelphia for that matter, okay? So it's, it's going to look different. The data will have a different characteristic, um, you know, maybe because of snow or some other atmospheric conditions, like maybe fog, rain, uh, something that isn't present in the California data. Uh, maybe people are going to look different because they're wearing heavy jackets and coats and hats as opposed to in the California data, you know, they're wearing shorts and t-shirts. So they're actually a lot of different reasons why uh, this domain shift in visual data can occur. And of course, it doesn't only occur in visual data. It can happen in other kinds of data, in audio, in uh, language, in um, RGBD data, depth data, all kinds of data. Um, so I, I work mostly on this problem of visual uh, data shift, but it, the, the, the methods that we work on actually apply to other kinds of data shift. Okay, so this is the problem. Um, basically, the issue is that what your network saw at training is not what it gets at test time. Um, so what's the solution? What can we do? Well, we can get the grad students who label the data to label it again, or, or Turkers, or whatever, right? We can... Um, go back and gather a lot of data from now our target, this is our target domain where we want the model to work and label all that data again and retrain our network. But this seems really unsatisfying, right? It seems like very inefficient. Uh, and it's not how humans learn. Like if you, if you learn to drive, for example, I learned to drive in California. And when I moved to Boston, I could still drive. You know, I had to learn a few new tricks but um, it's not like I couldn't tell, 
tell pedestrians when they were crossing the road. So it's not how humans learn. So we ideally we want uh, deep learning models to also um, be able to adapt to new domains and transfer knowledge, even though the underlying data distribution may be shifting or changing somehow. We want them to be able to adapt to this shift. So I'll, sh I'll give you an example of this domain shift, an actual model being affected by this domain shift. So this is, the task here is scene segmentation. So on the left, you see example images that are recorded from a dash cam, the, uh, a camera that's mounted on the dash of a car. Um, and on the right, you see the segmentation. So these are labels obtained from human labelers. And these labels are actually very time consuming to get. Right? So here, every pixel is labeled with a semantic category, like road. Uh, this pink area is, is all road. Gray scale is, uh, this gray part is building. People are a red color. Um, I think signs and others. So there are many different semantic categories labeled. So this is what the network should predict. Given an image, it should predict a semantic segmentation that looks like this. Um, and actually, um, what you see here are the outputs of a network that's trained on this kind of data and then applied to this kind of data. And you see it's doing very well. But now, if we take the same network, so it's trained on a data set called Cityscapes, which is collected from European roads. Um, and the results here are also from the same data set. But if you now take that same model and run it on San Francisco data. And in particular, this is a really, so first of all, you see that it's failing quite badly. It's not segmenting the road at all. It thinks there are trees where the road should be or buildings. Um, but another issue here is that this is actually, the car is going into a tunnel. So it's, it's a pretty severe kind of shift in terms of uh, the visual data. Here's another example. Um, so this is what uh, related to simulation because in this case we also are applying a segmentation model to the cityscapes data set. So you have images like this from the real world, but the model itself is trained on simulated data. Um, have any of you heard of the name Grand Theft Auto, the game? Yeah, so this model is actually trained on that game. So the data for training the deep model comes from the Grand Theft Auto game. And the nice thing about the Grand Theft Auto game is that we can actually get all the labels from the game, right? Uh, but it doesn't quite look very realistic. Um, so there is definitely a domain shift between the real data and the Graf Grand Theft Auto simulated data. So then uh, this image B is the ground truth label. So this is what it, the model should predict. But C is what it actually predicts. So it's really not. Um, as good as we'd like it to be. So it doesn't generalize that well from training and simulation to testing in the real world. And then what I'm going to show you today is that the good news is that we can actually do something about this. So we can actually um, develop models that are adaptive and that learn how to improve their performance on some target domain. So this is the output after adaptation from an algorithm that I'll describe today. And you can see it's still not perfect, but um, a lot of the segmentations have been cleaned up and, um, and appear much better. And also in terms of overall accuracy, um, this is a, a better model. OK, so feel free to stop me at any time. Happy to take questions if something is unclear. Um, good. So. First, I want to dive into the problem definition and some of the prior work um, in this area of domain adaptation. So this is the solution to this problem of the main shift is domain adaptation. It just refers to generally to a set of models that um, uh, attempt to transfer models, transfer knowledge from one domain to another. And then um, uh, in the rest of the talk, I will describe two approaches. Um, that we've worked on. One is called adversarial feature alignment, and the other one is adversarial dropout regularization. Um, and the common thing between them, is, as you can tell, is that they're both adversarial. 
So I'll define what that means and I'll, uh, I'll explain it later. But first, okay, let's think about how can we adapt a neural network. Right, so suppose you have a neural network that's trained on some data here. The data is, um, we call it source data, the data that has the, the supervision. In, in this case, in the form of labels, um, we are training a network to categorize objects into different uh, categories, like backpacks and uh, other objects. So we have a network. Um, this is a convolutional network. It has uh, layers of neurons. You can just think of this as some highly nonlinear function approximator if you're not familiar with convolutional networks or neural networks. Um, so it's learning to map the raw pixels into uh, higher level feature representations at each layer it becomes more and more high level until you get to the last layer which actually predicts the categories. So you have, if you have 10 categories, the last layer has 10 neurons and each one predicts one of the categories. So um, we train this using backpropagation, which is just gradient descent, um, to learn the parameters of all the layers. And we train it by minimizing some loss. So the loss usually says, OK, we have our task, which is predicting categories. So the loss is going to um, encourage the network to predict the correct categories for each image. So this is the task loss or the classification loss. And now we have a new domain this blue domain where the target data is coming from. Uh, and let's say that, you know, in this example, the source data is images from the web. Um, they have kind of very clean backgrounds, white backgrounds a lot of the time, um, whereas the target domain comes from some mobile robot that's moving around an office environment and just snapping photos. Um, and so the target domain looks quite different. So we want to take our model, so we don't have any labels, maybe we have a few, but for the re remainder of this talk, I'll actually assume that we have no labels in the target domain. Um, and so we want to apply or classify our train on the source to this target domain. But if we just apply it directly, it's not going to work very well for the reasons that I just showed you. So what else can we do? How can we improve the performance of this network on the target domain? So here I'm just showing you the same network that's been copied to the target domain. So I have two versions of the network, the source version and the target version. So I initialize a target version with the source network. Now I want to change these, either both networks or one of them, to somehow improve performance on the target domain. So what can I do? So one very common approach is to fine tune the network, right? You take a network train on one domain, you um, fine-tune it, but again, you need labels for that. And here we're assuming that we have zero or few labels in the target domain. But especially if you train, you know, a car in simulation to drive around, you want it to ideally just generalize to new scenarios, to new cities, and so on. So the idea then, um, and well, this is what I'll describe in the rest of the talk, is to do this in an unsupervised way by aligning feature distributions. All right, so we have some features being generated, as I said, some high-level features over here that capture some information about the image. Um, these features tend to capture, uh, capture things like edges at the low level and then mid-level features or things like object parts, maybe um, attributes of certain objects, and then at the high level they capture high-level semantic concepts. Um, but so these features being generated uh, by the source network on the source data essentially look different from the features being generated by the same source network on the target data because the target data has changed. Right? The distribution of the target data is different from the source. So our idea is going to be to align these feature distributions so that they are more similar. So we want to minimize the difference between these features. So we want to minimize the discrepancy. And, and then, if we're successful, then the idea is that uh, the features on the target domain will match the features on the source domain, so the classifier is not going to be, um, you know, it's, it's going to be able to classify the uh, target images better because it's not 
seeing some features that are very different from what it saw in training. So that's the main um, idea of feature alignment. Okay, so um, there are a couple of different ways that we can align deep feature distributions. And um, one of these ways is by minimizing the distance. So we have uh, two sets of points, uh, sets of uh, points in the source and sets of points in the target. And what we can do is just minimize some measure of distribution distance. So we want to minimize the the distance between the distributions. And so one way of doing that is by minimizing the uh, measure of maximum mean discrepancy, or MMD. Um, so there are, uh, there's an approach based on that that was published at ACML 15 by Long et al. And uh, it's essentially what it sounds like. It's just minimizing the maximum uh, distance between features across the two distributions. Another way to do that is using a different kind of distribution distance um, called a correlation alignment. So this is a model that we introduced in 2016, and it's essentially a similar idea, but we're minimizing the distance between correlations of features in the source and target. So this is kind of, um, instead of looking at the mean, we're looking at the second order statistics. Yes? So, yeah, let me go back to the slide. So uh, we have a pre-trained network that's trained on the source data, and it generates features on the source images. So by features, I mean like the activations of this layer, the layer before the classification layer. So it's distributions over the parameter spaces of the, of the approximate uh, They're distributions over activations of the last layer of the network. The output of the network. But not the final output. You're saying some intermediate feature representation. Uh, so, well, the last layer before the classification layer. Yeah, before the layer that's actually so, predicting. So, the... so you're, I mean, you're inducing a distribution over the parameter space. It's not over the parameter space. Yes. <laughs> but it's still a high dimensional distribution. So, I mean, in principle, like if you wanted to try to calculate relative entropy, it would be very difficult to do it with samples. Right? So are you just looking at first and second order statistics, essentially, of this distribution? So these two methods are looking at the first and second order statistics. However, you can kernelize these distances, and then they will look at high order statistics. Yeah, but it, I mean, if you wanted to do something more like information theoretic, right, by minimizing, say, relative entropy between the two distributions, mm -hmm. that's going to be a very hard problem yeah. if you don't have enough samples. With right. This, right, right. It's a hard problem. And also, you, we have to turn it into a loss that we can differentiate. Well, I want them to be similar. Right. So why should they be similar? Because um, the network was trained to predict some task on this feature distribution. So now it's getting a different feature distribution, and so it's going to have higher error because it's getting input features that it. it Uh, so the district. So that's a very good question. So far, I'm assuming that the classes are the same, right? So we want to reuse our source network to predict the same classes that it learned about. So it's the same classes, and I haven't actually said anything about the distribution over the labels in the target data. But essentially, for now, we're assuming that it's roughly the same distribution. Yeah, so we're actually going to update the parameters. So remember when I said that we start with our source network, and then we initialize the target network with the source parameters after training it on the source data? So we're going to start with those parameters, but we're going to update them. And we're going to update them in such a way as to minimize the difference between those feature distributions. There's also a theoretical result that says um, 
that the error, the generalization error of the classifier uh, will be higher if the difference between feature distributions is high. So that if the discrepancy between the domains is high. So that's another reason why we want to minimize the discrepancy between the, the two distributions. So you could share them or you could unshare them. Those are, uh, those are design choices, yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about that actually. Any other questions before we move on? Just any, any more basic questions? Because I don't want people to be. Yes? I'm not sure if it's a basic question or not. But in this, uh, in this situation, this target data is sort of like an adversarial example. Is that what you're saying? Um, it's not an adversarial example in the sense that someone kind of altered. tinkered or altered it. It's just, it just happens to come from. So all of our training data sets are sampled in some way, right? You collect them, and there's a sampling bias. So this is just data coming from a different way of sampling it. So of course, the underlying distribution of all visual data in the world, you know, if we had access to that, wouldn't change because we would have infinite data from any possible visual scenario. But because we're always sampling some fixed size data set, it will always have some sampling bias. So like, you know, images from online websites versus images from a, a robot in an office. OK. Good. So um, right. So I mentioned these two ways of aligning distributions by minimizing maximum mean discrepancy or correlations. Um, but what I'll actually talk about today is a slightly different approach, which is based on adversarial domain alignment. So here, again, we're trying to minimize uh, the differences between the feature distributions and the source and target, but we're going to do it in an adversarial learning way. So how many people have heard of GANs? Awesome. So I don't need to tell you then what adversarial is, um, but I still will. Don't worry. Um, so basically, it's, it's uh, going to rely on uh, a, a type of min-max problem that GANs also optimize, but this is not going to be a GAN. It's actually, let's maybe um, propose around the same time that GANs were proposed. Uh, because GANs typically, they try to generate an image, so generative models. We're not going to be generating images. We're just going to be generating features that match a given feature distribution. Whereas GANs generate actual images, so the actual inputs X in our setup. Uh, we're not going to be doing that here. Um, so I just want to mention briefly that there's quite a lot of exciting work in this area. Uh, it's very um, active research area. There are a couple of very recent papers that have come out, like learning transferable representations um, and supervised image-to-image -image translation. So actually, some of these papers do generate images, even though I just told you I'm not going to be generating images. But that's just this, the work I'm going to talk about today. But there are approaches that do generate. They essentially translate in the pixel domain between domains. Um, and then this uh, cycle GANs are also related, although uh, they weren't applied for domain adaptation. But they also have this flavor of taking a set of images from one domain and making them look like a different domain. OK. so. Um, what are some of the applications of domain adaptation before I tell you the details of our algorithm? Um, so there are actually, we've actually applied it to quite a few different kinds of domain shifts. Most of it has actually been on uh, classification of objects. And um, you know the, shift, the kind of shifts that we looked at are, for example, from one data set to another one. So I, I already told you about this one, the data collected in uh, one city, and then we want to transfer the model to a different city, or uh, from web images to robot images. Uh, we've also applied it to a shift between uh, RGB and depth. So you can think of these two as different domains. They're actually different modalities, different sensors, but you can think of them as a uh, change in the feature distribution, especially if you encode it in such a way that you know, they're kind of encoded in the same way. So you can actually do domain alignment on this. We've also applied it to um, performing tasks with a robot. So um, we train a robot to 
uh, perform a task like placing a rope on a scale in simulation. So this is all trained in a simulator. And then we wanted to apply this same visual model to a real image, which of course looks quite different. And we showed that domain adaptation succeeds to some degree in improving performance. And then uh, finally, um, also training in simulation, but more for object category models. So can we learn about object categories in simulation and then apply those models to real images? And this is actually quite a, a drastic domain shift, you know, similar to this one, but here we just have a lot more variety in terms of how, how different object categories look like. So, so our models have to handle that. Okay, so let me get into some details of adversarial feature alignment. So most of you, it sounds like, already are familiar with adversarial networks, but I'll just briefly recap what they are. So essentially, we have two networks. Here I have the white spy and the black spy. They're the two adversaries. They're two networks that are adversaries. And they're, they are trained in such a way that uh, one network learns to essentially do something, like the black spy learns to do something, and the white spy learns to, to fool it or to kind of make it fail, right? So they're adversaries in that sense. And so specifically, let's say we have these two networks. One of them is the encoder network. Um, and the encoder network, here it's the white spy, is the network that takes an image and generates features, okay? So that's the encoder network. And then the second network, um, I call it the um, um, adversary, yeah. So the encoder network generates features um, and the distribution of these features is P. So that's this red histogram. Um, and what we want is we want the, so, so these red features are, are features uh, extracted from the source domain. Um, and we want it to match the features in the target domain, which is the blue distribution. So we want the distribution P to match the distribution Q. That's the goal of the encoder network. And the way we make that happen is by introducing this adversary network. And the adversary, the black spy, what it does is it tries to discriminate between these two feature distributions. So its job is to, given an input feature, assign a label to it. Is it from distribution P or distribution Q? Or alternatively, is it from the source domain or from the target domain? Okay, so, so this um, network tries to discriminate dis uh, domains essentially, and this one tries to match them. So their goals are completely opposite of each other. And so as the encoder tries to fool the adversary, so it basically tries to maximize the error of the adversary network, the only way it can do that is by aligning the distributions so that they're indistinguishable, which means that the features are becoming invariant to the change in domains. And as the encoder tries to do this, it tries to align feature distributions. The adversary tries harder. Oops. And then we iterate this process until convergence, at which point, essentially, the adversary, uh, hopefully, if things converge well, the adversary can no longer tell the difference between the source and target domain. And the encoder has learned to generate features that are invariant to the domain. OK? So more uh, specifically, how this works is we have our two networks. So these are. Um, the source network and the target network, which is initialized with the source parameters. And then we have our classification layer with the classification loss. We still have that loss on the source examples, but not on the target. And we can share the parameters between the source and target encoder, or we can unshare them. And then we introduce this discriminator adversary network. Here I'm calling it the discriminator. It's basically a domain classifier network that takes features from the encoder and the source and the encoder and the target and applies this adversarial loss. Okay, so in the beginning, the feature distributions will be quite different. The encoder tries to learn to minimize 
or maximize the discriminator's error and ends up aligning the features and then the discriminator learns, try, tries harder to discriminate them and we iterate this process until finally the discriminator or the adversary can no longer tell the difference between the two domains. Okay? Is it clear how to decide what to that iteration? No. <laughs> so, yes, that's a very good question. Um, and the problem is that we're assuming we have no labels on the target domain, so how do we know that it's doing something reasonable in the target domain? I mean, we could, we could do some tricks. We could um, look at the source performance, make sure that the network hasn't completely diverged and is no longer doing well on the source. But that's, that still doesn't help us on the target domain. Um, so you could look at um, things like the discrepancy. So you could c compute the distance between distributions and see how, if it's getting smaller, for example. Yeah, you could, you could do it that way. But the other issue is kind of how fast the learning rate happens on the, the adversary versus the learning rate on the generator. Yes, and this is a min-max problem. It's an adversarial learning problem, and they're notoriously unstable. If any of you have ever worked with GANs, you will know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I see some people nodding. Um, but if it does converge, it actually can work quite well. So, um, as I said, there are a couple of choices we can make here. We can share the encoder parameters across the two domains or not. We can also play around with which loss we're using, which adversarial loss. There are different options. And as I alluded to before, the actual encoder network could just be discriminative, meaning it just takes an image and maps it to a feature representation, or it could be generative, which means it actually takes the image and maps it to another image that looks more like the source domain. Um, so that's called um, generative domain ad adaptation. So I'm not going to talk about that. Today I'm going to focus on the discriminative approach. So depending on which choices we make, we actually end up with different methods. So here in this table, I'm just listing a couple of existing methods. Uh, gradient reversal is one. It's using a discriminative base model. So by that, I just mean what I drew here, just a base model that maps images to features. Um, it does share weights across the two encoders, and it uses uh, minimax adversarial loss. Again, I'm not going to go into details on this, but just to show you kind of if you make different choices, you get different methods that are out there in the literature. Um, so I'm going to talk about the domain confusion uh, method. Or actually, am I going to talk about domain? Maybe I'm going to talk about ADA instead. I'm not sure. Okay, yeah. So if you use a, um, an adversarial loss that we came up with called the con domain confusion loss, then you end up with this domain confusion method. But they're basically quite similar. Um, they just differ in these choices, design choices. And they do have different performance. So these design choices do affect performance. OK, yep. So I'm going to talk about the domain confusion approach. So here, um, the loss is of this particular form. So I'm going to walk through uh, what each of the equations is representing. So the first equation is the discriminator loss, LD. So that's the loss that um, we're going to, the discriminator tries to, or the adversary, the black spy tries to, to minimize. And it's taking in the source inputs, XS, the target inputs, XT. So these are images in the source and target domains. And then the parameters of the encoder network, that's the white spy. So here the parameters are fixed because we're only learning the um, adversary parameters or the domain classifier parameters. So theta d are the only parameters being learned here. And it's minimizing the domain classifier loss, which is just, is just a cross entropy loss where qd is shown down here. It's just the soft max, right? So it's predicting essentially a probability of the domain label yd being equal to 1 given the input x, right? So it's just, it's just a uh, cross entropy on the domain label. And the main label here is binary, so it's either one domain or the other domain, source or target. Okay, so that's just a domain classifier loss. And then down here is L 
confusion, the, conf uh, the main confusion loss. And this is where we hold the other stuff fixed, but we minimize over the network parameters. So we, we're adjusting the encoder parameters, the white spy network, um, to minimize this loss. So here the domain classifier is fixed, and the loss is this, what we call a domain confusion loss. And all it is is just a cross-entropy loss with a uniform distribution over the domain labels. So what it's saying is it's saying minimize the cross-entropy between the output of the domain classifier and the uniform distribution over domain labels. So it's going to force the domain classifier to become confused about which domain. So it's going to try to force it to output a uniform distribution over domain labels. Right, so this is, this is what the encoder is trying to do, um, and, and the adversary domain classifier tries to minimize its loss, which is cross-entropy, so it's trying to accurately predict which domain the feature came from. So then we iterate this process, okay? So these are just this details of how we, we could implement this adversarial feature alignment. There are other ways of implementing it as well. Okay, so that's domain confusion. Um, there's another way of implementing it, which is we could, so in domain confusion, our encoder in, uh, in the source and target features were shared. Sorry, the, the weights were shared. Now if we unshare them, and we use a different loss called the GAN loss, then we get this method called ADA. So this is a method that we came up with, again, just by changing those two things, and actually turned out to work better. Uh, one of the reasons is the GAN loss turned out to be um, a little bit easier to uh, optimize than the domain confusion loss. And also this um, unsharing of the two encoders helped. So it's basically a more flexible model where you aren't forcing the encoder to learn the exact same feature mapping for both source and target domains. They can, they can learn different feature mappings. All right, so I'll show you some results. Um, so here we are evaluating the approaches on this, uh, these three domains of digits. So the first two domains are MNIST and USPS. And they actually look quite similar to humans, right? Like, can you tell the difference between these two domains? You kind of can tell if you, if you look closely. Um, but they're both, they're both uh, handwritten digits, white on black backgrounds. And then this third domain is called Street View House Numbers. These are also digits, but they are from photos from St Google Street View of house numbers on, on buildings cropped around the numbers. So the, the task in all cases is to predict the category of the digits. There are 10 different categories of the digits. So here we're predicting the center digit in the house numbers. And if you look at the results, um, so each column here shows training on one domain and then testing on a different domain. So the first column shows training on MNIST and testing on USPS. So the domain shift is from MNIST to USPS. And source only means that we just train the source model on MNIST and directly test it on USPS. And you can see that the source only performance here is around 75% accuracy. And that's terrible. On this digit problem with modern convolutional networks, we should be getting 99.9% .9 accuracy. So 70% is really bad, right? So this kind of just showcases I think really well how sensitive these um, deep neural networks are to domain shift because, you know, to a human, if you train on something like this, it should be able to generalize to something like that, but it actually doesn't. So um, if we then apply some of these adaptation models that align features, we start seeing some improvement. Um, so the last method that I described, ADA, which is um, also doing adversarial adaptation, is in the last row. So I'll just talk about that, those results. So you see that with this ADA met method, we're going from 75% accuracy to 89% accuracy on the MNIST to USPS shift. And um, it's slightly worse than this COGAN method, which is 
a different approach. On the USPS to MNIST, so that's the reverse shift. It's kind of a similar trend, but now we're getting 90% and Kogan is getting 89%. But the original source only performance here was 57, so even worse than in the, origin, the first direction. And then if we train on house numbers and test on MNIST, that's the last column here, then the source only is at around 60% accuracy. And with our ADA approach, we improve that to about 76% accuracy. So this is with no labels at all on the target domain, which is kind of cool. All right, so it's fully unsupervised adaptation. Um, and then this Kogan approach actually didn't converge on this particular shift, potentially because uh, it's a very, two very different do domains as opposed to the first two shifts where the domains are more similar to each other. Is that without the uh, data augmentation, or did you do a lot of data augmentation? So here we did the standard data augmentation, which is cropping, I think, um, injecting noise. But you do like that. Yeah, I think that helps to some degree, um, but it doesn't, doesn't solve the problem. Yeah. I mean, here, because like, we know what the shifts are. We, for example, we could crop these digits exactly the same way. They're more cropped, and we can maybe blur them a little bit, and that would reduce the domain shift. But then you need to know exactly what changed between domains, and I'm, I'm personally more interested in methods that can automatically learn what's changed between domains. So we don't have to specify it. We don't have to engineer a different solution for each domain shift. Okay, so, um, so then we also apply it across um, RGB and depth data. And here the results are not as high. It's a much more difficult problem. Um, the task is to classify objects. And we train a model on labels in the RGB domain, and then we adapt it on the depth domain. And we see some improvements. So the source-only performance across all categories is around 13% uh, accuracy. We improve that to 21, but it's still quite low. If you train on the depth domain, you get about 46% accuracy. Uh, they're all shown here, so I'm not sure, actually, like maybe a dozen, 20 classes or something. Yeah. So this is a difficult data set. Um, okay, so I have about 15 minutes, so I want to tell you about another method that we came up with more recently that actually improves even more on the one that I just showed you. And we call this adversarial dropout regularization. Okay, so if we go back to this picture, we had the encoder CNN that was generating some features and the classifier which is just we're treating as just the last layer of the network but it could easily be the last two or three layers of the network it's actually kind of an arbitrary distinction in some ways where what part is the classifier and what part is the encoder um, so the classifier was essentially learning a boundary between categories right so here this black line is visualizing the boundary learned by the classifier between two classes. So the x's are one class and the circles are another class. Right, so, um, and then we have the target domain where the, the same encoder CNN generates features whose distribution is different from the source features. So that was our problem and then we introduce uh, discriminator, domain discriminator, this adversary network that tries to distinguish between the green and the red features, between the two domains, and we um, try to fool that discriminator to align the features, right? So if we do that well, then if the encoder learns to uh, fool the discriminator, then the green and the red features are now aligned, right? So here they weren't aligned, and here they are aligned. But there's another problem here which is if we go back and look at the classifier learned on the source domain, right? So I'm just showing you the exact same classifier as I did here. So now we see that there are these features being generated here, the target domain features, that are very close to the decision boundary of the classifier. And what that means is that those features 
are not very discriminative. And they will produce very low confidence predictions and potentially incorrect predictions. So what's happening is that even though we're aligning these two feature distributions, we're not taking into account the decision boundaries between the categories. Right? We're just aligning the entire distribution. We're not taking the decision boundaries into account. So that's what we wanted to do to fix this problem, is to actually solve this problem of these ambiguous features, which is, I'm just showing you the same picture I showed you before, where we take the two domains, green and red, we align them, but now we have all these ambiguous features near the decision boundary. So that's a problem, um, and that reduces the, the accuracy of, on the target domain. So instead, what we want is we want to avoid generating these ambiguous features. We essentially want to encourage the encoder to push features away from that decision boundary. That's going to be our solution. Right? But the goal is here is to avoid this case where we have features in the target domain that are being generated close to the decision boundary. So we hope that by doing this, then all the correct classes go on this correct, uh, the points that belong to the um, cross class go on, on top, and the points that belong to the circle class go on the bottom. But we have no way of making sure of that, of course, because we don't have labels on the target sample. But we hope that's what happens. OK, so what's the solution? So the solution is to change what the critic does, or the discriminator. Sorry, I keep using different terms. I've called an adversary and a discriminator. Um, all these terms are, get used in, this, in the literature. So now, let's call it the critic, OK? What used to be the adversary is now the critic. So we're going to change what the critic does. So we basically want now, we want our critic to detect samples that are near the boundary. And we still train our generator, I call it G here, to fool the critic. But I'm going to change what the critic does. OK, and specifically, the critic is going to try to detect when the target samples are close to the decision boundary. So how can we do that? Well, we can do that by taking the original boundary and shifting it a little bit, just slightly perturbing the decision boundary. And then the samples that are near the boundary, the uh, output probability predicted by the classifier, the original task classifier, will change more significantly for samples that are closer to the boundary. Does that make sense? So if we perturb the decision boundary, the samples that are near it will have much bigger change in their output probabilities. So if we measure that change before and after we perturb the decision boundary, we call it the sensitivity. We want to maximize the sensitivity. That's what the critic is going to do. It's going to try to maximize its sensitivity. And then the encoder is going to try to minimize the sensitivity by generating features, essentially, that are farther away from the decision boundary so that the sensitivity of the critic is lowered. OK. And how we're going to do that? So we need to make this change, right? We need to perturb the decision boundary. And the way we're going to do that is using dropout. So dropout is essentially um, an approach that's used a lot in training neural networks, where during training, we randomly drop certain nodes. So here, we take the original network. This one has three layers. And we drop these two uh, nodes in the second layer. Or here, we drop the second and the third nodes in the second layer. But this happens randomly, just with some probability at each uh, training iteration, we, we drop some of the nodes. So this, that's how dropout is normally used. That's not how we're going to use it. Okay. So the way we're going to use dropout is to change the classifier to slightly perturb the decision boundary. Okay. So if we take the original classifier and we drop some of the nodes randomly, its decision boundary is going to change, but not very much. Okay. We don't want to drastically alter it. Just change it a little bit. Okay. So to summarize, we're essentially taking um, the original classifier that's trained on our task. We are sampling two classifiers using dropout. And that's going to be our critic. And the critic is going to measure the sensitivity 
or how much the two versions of the classifier disagree on samples in the target. And then the generator will try to fool this critic. So this is the full model. We call this the adversarial dropout regularization technique, or ADR. Uh, and it's a paper at iClear this year. Um, and so what this is doing is, again, I'm just showing you the full model now. We have data x coming in to g, the encoder network. The encoder network generates some features, which are fed into the two classifiers, C1 and C2, that are sampled by dropout. This is our critic. So each of these C1 and C2 uh, gives some prediction, the probability over the class labels. We measure their sensitivity. This is just the distance between the two probabilities. You can use different ways of measuring that distance, um, KL divergence, for example. Um, and then we fix G and train C to maximize this distance. So that's the first set, set step in the adversarial training. And then we train G and C together to minimize regular cross entropy on source. That's just their tax, task loss. And finally, we fix C and train G, the encoder, to minimize the sensitivity. Right? So we alternate between. Um, training the critic to maximize sensitivity and training the encoder to minimize it. OK. So it works. And it works because, well, this is our interpretation, is because each unit in the network is going to learn dissimilar characteristics of the data to measure the sensitivity. So in a way, like the critic is trying to overfit to the data so that it becomes more sensitive. Right? So if we sample these two classifiers using dropout, their output probabilities change slightly. Um, and what's happening is that these nodes that are not shared, so we can think of these two networks as basically sharing most of the nodes, but there are certain nodes that are not shared. And those nodes that are not shared are learning different characteristics of the data. OK? That's, that's one explanation for why it works. All right, so let me show you some um, experiments really quickly. So we go back to this digit example. And um, I'm not sure if you can see it very well. Let me just zoom in a little bit. So we, uh, before I showed you this ADA method, and it was getting 76% accuracy on SVHN to MNIST, which is this street view house numbers uh, is the source domain, and MNIST is the target domain. And so with this um, EDR approach, we actually go from 76 to 96. So much, much better accuracy on this difficult, the most difficult shift in this data set. And then for the other two shifts, we get about 91%. So again, no labels on the target. We're just doing this uh, alignment. But now with the critic that tries to measure sensitivity and tries to basically find samples that are close to the decision boundary. So the reason that we have this improvement is because we're taking the decision boundary into account. We're not throwing that information away. Any questions? Yep. So for the two easier to make shifts, um, there was improvement but not as much. Do you think that's because the original algorithm wasn't predicting things close to the decision boundary? Or you seem to have a lot of improvement on the yeah. Yeah, so I'm not sure why it's improving less on the other two, but it could be that um, aligning categories was not the, ma the major problem on those two tasks. Yep. Oh, yes. That sh so yeah, there are six combinations here. We're only, sh yeah, we're only evaluating on three. <sighs> It's kind of not a good reason, just that when most papers compare on those shifts, so we compare on those shifts. But yeah, you can, you can go the other way, too. Mm -hmm. Yep. What uh, percentages of nodes are you talking about? And like how sensitive is uh, the accuracy to, to how much dropout? It's a very good question. I think we're dropping 10%, but I'm not sure if I remember that correctly. 
Um, and uh, yeah, if you drop out more, it will become more sensitive, right? Uh, in the paper, we also do some analysis of what happens on the source examples and all like those curves, but I don't have really time to go into that. I want to show you really quickly, because um, I'm out of time, I'm going to show you some results on synthetic data. So we apply this model to uh, this domain shift from synthetic CAD models to um, real images of the same category. So here we have 12 different object categories.